except for AJ, our presenter. And so I've known AJ for quite a while now. AJ is from the great state of Illinois and has had several roles and responsibilities with the Green Party over the years. So I am gonna turn it over to AJ and they are gonna share their screen, I think. And that will happen shortly. I know it just looked like you were testing it out and it was working, AJ. All right, AJ, do you need me to share your, oh, there we go. All right, there we go. And, there we go. and can we hear you? And we can see you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Everything looks good. All right, I'm going to mute myself. All right. Uh, thank you, Hillary, for that. Um, and thank you very much for uh, attending Go living room. this um, presentation. And, uh, you know, I wish um, we were all meeting in person. Um, I've been coming to um, conventions and annual national meetings since 2008. It's great to kind of be in person and kind of doing this, but you know, we're in this pandemic and you know, we got to do what we have to do at this moment. But I'm glad we are here together as Greens to learn from one another what we need to be doing in this election and moving forward as well. Um, I did this workshop at the Salt Lake City annual national meeting, um, it was well received then, so I figured, hey, let's try it again, see what happens. So here we are, and like I said, thank you for being here. Um, I just want to set some ground rules, like I usually do at any presentation I do like this. Um, first and foremost, let's just have fun. Um, uh, all of us Greens, you know, we have a lot of serious work to do. One another and all that. Um, this is a safe space for those next few minutes that we have with each other. Um, so from that safe space, let's just be mindful of each other. Um, if there's something concerning, please address it and we'll try and resolve it as much as possible. Uh, try to ask questions pertaining to the workshop. Um, it's great to hear from stories and other things that have happening, but let's talk about the material at hand. Um, something I can answer or someone else in the room that has other responses, please respond to it to this pertaining to this workshop. Um, side conversations, um, if you would please respect everyone speaking and just mute your mic until you're um, recognized um, by myself, if not Hillary, um, and step up, step back, you know, uh, it's let everyone's, so that everyone can speak as well, you know, and everyone can be heard and everything. Um, so if we can just be mindful of doing that, that'd be great. Um, so this workshop is important for a few reasons. One of which is uh, we, we need to learn about our state political landscape and communicate what's, what's going on. And uh, I've primarily lived in the Midwest um, most of my life. Um, I have been to other states, but my organizing, my political strategy, strategy um, career has been primarily in the Midwest. And um, it's, and through that experience, um, what I've seen, like at meetings, we always talk about what's going on, but it's mostly very metrocentric. Uh, when I say metrocentric, and I'll get to in a minute what rural area means in a second, but we tend to kind of gravitate towards around more metro areas, issues that um, revolve around metro issues. We don't go to rural areas. Um, there's not a lot, there's not, there's not been meetings I've been to where we go to meetings in a rural community where a green chapter's at, or just going there just to say, hey, we're here to listen to you. Um, so rural areas play a large role in the political landscape that we're all in. Uh, and this is a lot of tools for your toolbox. If this is your first time campaigning, you want to learn more, great. If you're the veteran campaigner and you're one or more, that's awesome as well. Uh, these are just a lot of tools, um, a lot of information I'm going to be providing to you is a little bit more on the academic side as well as the praxis side. So hopefully I give you enough balance of those two. And again, um, rural issues provide a big ripple in, in a 
elections. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more what that means, but just to tease, uh, if we can just win issues in rural areas, whether it's like maybe a state race, uh, a county race, uh, a special local race, those have big impacts. Uh, it's great to run for Senate. It's great to run for Congress. Great to run for governor. Those are awesome, and we should support Greens who are doing that. But we also need to look at these local, these rural areas. Uh, there's a lot of issues that we tend to forget from time to time. So if we can focus on those efforts, we can provide a much more ripple effect in our, our outcomes. So when I talk about a rural area, I'm talking about an area that's incorporated, that's an incorporated area that's at least 2,500 people, um, but no less than 50,000. So, so 50,000 is the cap, 2,500 is at most, you know, and this is, is according to um, the, the USDA, uh, the, the census, uh, CDC, a lot of these organizations, you know, kind of define rural areas like that. Anything less than 2,500, um, it may be in, uh, unincorporated, which is usually a village, maybe a town, whatever your state refers to those areas as. Um, so and when we talk about rural communities, we're talking about these kinds of areas. And anything also over 10,000 is another definition called uh, micro Politan. So it's a, a town big enough, and it's usually the county seat, or it's another city that could have been a county seat. So these micropolitan areas um, play a huge role in our rural communities that we all live in. Uh, and just so you know, you know, 46 million U.S. residents live in rural communities, according to the CDC. So this image is to show you mostly rural counties. You know, so this is to date, you know, mostly all rural counties, the ones in the darker orange color is um, those rural counties. And the ones in green are completely rural. No one's living there. If very, very few people. So if you kind of look, at these images, there's a lot of overlap here. So those that are mostly rural, which means they may have a town in there, or they also have um, some sort of like a semblance of gatherings of folks there, to those that are just rural, and if you know it's like mostly plain states going more into the mountain areas, um, these are completely rural areas. So this is huge. 97% of US land is covered by rural areas as, we, as you just saw. 19% of the US population live in these areas. 70% of the adults live in single family homes. 65% live in their state of birth. Uh, the median age is around 51. Uh, less than 4% of rural residents uh, have live like also live in another country and this is all by the census report so when we look at these statistics uh, we have to be mindful of this again when I talk about our political landscape almost everyone in our country lives in one of these rural areas in one in one way or another and we'll talk a little bit more about issues, um, particularly um, around jobs, the economy, poverty, um, housing. Um, th these are issues that we also need to be mindful of because rural areas have to address this. So, <clears throat> according to the according to HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, uh, this is a definition of what's considered homeless in rural areas. So a person has to either one, uh, lacks a fixed regular and adequate nighttime residence, which as you can see, um, they don't define what that means other than number two, um, of a primary nighttime residence, 
that is either a supervised publicly or private operated shelter, an institution that provides temporary residence, um, or a public or private place. This is this is the definition of homelessness, and and I, don't, and I live in a town, I live in a rural area currently. Um, I live 90 minutes west of Chicago in Illinois, and in my in my town I'm in right now nearly about 60% of people are homeless. And out of that 60% is uh, women and those in the LGBT community as well, um, of young, young adults, that is. So, so this definition, we have, we have a homeless problem. And I'm sure all of us have, have seen this in our areas. And based on this, you know, we have a huge homeless problem in rural areas. Um, and I say up here, the hidden homeless in rural areas, because a lot of our communities kind of want to, you know, pull the rug up and dust underneath and put the rug down and say, we don't have a homeless problem. We don't have that at all. Um, we have housing, we have people living in homes and everything. And they'll even make ordinances to kind of push the homeless away, just to show people say, hey, you know, we, we don't have a homeless problem. And this is even true for like, not just the bigger towns, even micropolitans in the town like I live in does this. So this is a chart um, that shows like job growth in rural areas. Um, and if you can see it, um, the blue line of what's the metro area, red is the rural area and we, we have been losing some job growth in rural in the rural areas for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and in my view, it's a, a built in agenda to really depopulate rural areas. So I mean, so this gives you an idea of like the employment growth right here. And this is 2008 numbers. But if we extrapolate 10 years past that, um, the rural line will be much going down further and further south. So when we talk about um, one of the issues is, is poverty. Uh, uh, another statistic, 16%, um, almost 17% of the rural population is between 25 and 45. That isn't poverty. One and a half million children live in poverty and, and I'm saying poverty in the general sense there's kind of two other definitions there's like absolute poverty and I'm not going to get into that but just in general poverty these are the numbers and then if we break down the percentage of children living in poverty we, we can kind of see there's an even inequality right there um, when it comes to race comes with poverty and uh, I'll be more than happy to sh share this presentation with anyone who wants this and I'll put my email in the chat box so you can send me an email because on here um, you can have little links on here that you can go to see this data for yourself as well um, and, and particularly in mind about poverty um, Brian uh, Fien who's a professor at um, Penn State University he does a lot of uh, rural sociology and the one down here that says rural economy and the barriers to work in rural America um, is a really good read. Um, ties into all this information I'm just talking about here on this slide. So housing, uh, there has been a drop in the median income uh, when it comes to individuals, um, which is around $40,000, there's been a, a drop off. So $40,000 is the cap and anything past that. We start seeing more and more of more of a mean around 20,000 or less of people who are making an income. Um, and rural homes are usually substandard. And what, what I mean by that is uh, there are some, not every area, but there are some towns that don't have like zoning laws. And because because of that, anyone can build their house however they want to build their homes. So therefore, the, the uh, structural integrity of a home 
maybe subpar. Um, and sometimes there's areas in rural rural areas that they don't have the means to pay for home improvement for themselves or pay for professionals to do the kind of work that needs to be done and everything. So there are times that homes are a little substandard. Many of the homes, they're owned, owned by a bank or development. And right next to it, I have houseless. There's a difference between homeless and houseless. Houseless means that there are homes available, but they're not in the market because they're owned by the banks. They're owned by economic developers. So they keep these homes and they'll just wait and wait until uh, property sales just go down to the point that they'll put a foreclosure, foreclosure and then sell it at a very inexpensive rate or get it to a point that they'll just decimate a home or more and put something else in there as well. Or they'll do something, what I feel is worse, is make a TIF district, and that way they'll do what they want with those homes and then start gentrifying that part of town as well. So when you go to like your county assessor's office and you want to make, you want to see where these, where they're at with these homes, because you've seen it sit there for months and months, years and years. Go check out county assessor's office. There's a whole listing of those lots, and they'll tell you what the status is and who owns those. Um, again, just pointing right here in my town. If you just go to downtown, I can point to you like uh, six, seven homes and townhouses that are owned not just by a bank, but a realtor in Chicago. They don't live here, they just buy property here, and those are even substandard um, to the point where I had to work with a gentleman to address a bed bug issue in, in his place. And the realtor didn't want to do anything, so he'd go to like City Hall, address that issue, um, had to navigate him through City Hall because the city commissioner at the time and had to go through all that. So this, this is another interesting area when it comes to housing, where you have people like the banks, um, developers and realtors that just acquire homes, hoard homes, that is. Um, many housing options are hours away. So if you are in need of shelter, some rural areas don't have those options. Uh, you may have a Y. WCA that it doesn't have a home housing, or you may not even have a private shelter doesn't have, if not 45 minutes out from your rural area, just to find housing. And not a lot of options of section eight housing either. Home ownership has declined at a 3% rate between 2009 and 2018. And then as you can see, there's even more inequality when it comes to homes, who owns them. And then we get to the issue of redlining when it comes to owning homes by race, that this is a, uh, an effect of redlining in the United States. So another issue is uh, rural health care and social services. Uh, there are very, very few medical practitioners, health, mental health programs, facilities, public health facilities in rural areas. This has a, been a growing concern even pre-COVID. Um, um, there's always been these issues. Uh, there's always a lack of medical services. There may be a town 15, 20 minutes away, maybe half hour away, that may be the, low get, low, the closest, excuse me, the closest uh, emergency medical service in order to get to somebody. Uh, and as I said, very few social service agencies in town, you may have the one that kind of monopolizes a lot of the clientele and the kind of the programs they need and everything. Um, there is a push for telehealth. Um, there was telehealth prior to COVID. Um, there wasn't um, telehealth before, and the issue is like funding. 
as well as the the ethics of telehealth and when it comes to rural areas they didn't know like what that would look like um and especially one that i worked with an agency i worked with uh the telehealth service that we had to send a client in there but their um psychiatrist was in texas and they only saw him for like 10 minutes and they saw him like once a month and so we couldn't even get this person to get the adequate service they need the help the need um because of that lack as well as you know trying to offer more and more accessibility with telehealth um i saw chris richardson raise his hand What's right. Question? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we started a not-for-profit taking the VA's integrated hospital system and moving it out into open source. Oh, nice. or, Oroville Hospital in um, uh, uh, California is using our software and they're actually making money off of it. it it's FOIA. It's Freedom of Information Act. And we've also been working on uh, home health care where you actually have a, a system sitting there monitoring you 724 uh, monitoring your sleep so that you know if you have a, a, a you know a, a, a problem with uh, sleep apnea uh, it can alert your, your treatment team as well as maybe affect your environment so that you wake up and start breathing again, little things like that. Um, but uh, this, these are things that uh, are very doable and very possible. And, uh, you know, uh, worldvista.org uh, will we'll tell you more about it. And it's free for download. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, and stuff like that, I'll, I'll, I would like to hear. Um, because I, I would never knew about this. Um, but it's, it's programs, what Chris just mentioned, that are available. But then the question becomes, how do we make it accessible in rural areas? And, and to Chris's point about like veterans, so we just, well, not just, we have a vet clinic, a, excuse me, a VA clinic, not a vet clinic, a VA clinic here in my town um because the next closest va clinic is iowa city which is about an hour and a half away 90 minutes away west of me so without that you know our vets wouldn't have the kind of service they need um to get provided and everything but it's, it's programmed if, if i'm hearing you right chris is something that's much needed and everything um just to wrap the slide up issue when it comes to healthcare and social services, if you go to organizations like uh, the, the Rural Social Work Caucus, if you go to like look up information from rural sociologists or social workers, psychologists, you, you would you would find that some of the issues related to these is like it's a substance abuse, um, health behavior by health behavior. Um, I'm, I'm talking about like how do we behave when it comes to like the kind of food we eat are we exercising the kind of wellness we need because there's also a lack of a wellness program or accessibility to wellness programs outside of just trying to get out and walk maybe do some exercising like that but like you no know, gyms um, things of that nature food scarcity I'll talk about agriculture in a second but when I talk about food scarcity uh, there may not be more than one grocery store. If it is the one grocery store, it's like probably like right in the middle of town where a lot of people from different directions have to come to that part of town. So that's like a better part of their day where someone has a plan, has to go to the grocery store, and then while they're out, they might as well do this, might as well do the other thing, and then come back home. Uh, there's times like we don't have a butcher in my town. So if I have to cook for friends, uh, I'll go to the next town 20 minutes west of me just to go to the local like butcher there and then swing back and go, oh, I'll stop at 
this town to get these groceries and then my town again for groceries. So that's like, that's kind of food scarcity I'm talking about. You know, a lot, there might be food deserts in these rural areas. So we have to travel in a lot of places and a lot of rural areas don't have mass transit either. So agriculture, when you think rural, you do think agriculture and rightfully so. Farming contributes to 100 billion in the US economy. Farmers and ranchers make up 1.3% of the labor force. And in 1870, it was 70%. So, so from 1870 to now, is a huge drop off. And again, we, we when we look at these numbers, we have to think, you know, why why this gap? Why has this? Why is this a thing? Farming has changed a lot over the years uh, when it comes to growing mono, monoculture crops. And when I say monoculture, for those who may not know, uh, just growing coin, corn, just growing soy, just just growing wheat, alfalfa instead of trying to grow corn and something else next to each other, which has been done before. Um, uh, you also have farmers who may not do uh, crops, but they'll do livestock. And then even that number gets a little bit smaller, um, particularly if you get to places <clears throat> where they just do beef, cattle, they'll do hogs um, and chickens. You know, so they have these big farms that do that kind of thing. But again, 1.3% of them. Now, 44% in the United States, 44% of agricultural land is in the United States. But only 17% of it is deemed arable, according to the World Bank. So arable means that you can actually grow crops on these lands. All right, so 17% out of the 44 of agricultural land. And again, there's 97% of the United States is rural. And of that 97%, 44 is agriculture, but 17 is only areas that you can grow crops on. And you can see the list um, starting in 1961 and how that percentage has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller when it comes to arable land. It was at 19%, then it went up to 20%, and then from 1992, it kind of dropped off. And now we're kind of seeing 16%, we may see even 14% um, come, 20, come this year. Now, again, this is probably due to, like, not a lot of families are farming anymore. Uh, there's not a lot of people who want to invest time and energy into farming. And when they do farm, then a lot of the farmers have to get into big farm, F-A-R-M. So they work with like Monsanto Bay, or they have to work with um, those kind of companies to uh, raise crops, as well as working with like Swiss Colony, um, and other companies to do like dairy products, things of that nature. So, and not only that, but there's also issues around agriculture, you know, climate change. We, we, we can't talk about agriculture without climate change. For those of you who do live in the Midwest, you probably have seen a, a farmer you know, or a, a nearby area where their crops were drenched with water. Uh, some years there's been a dry spout, you know, uh, other places they can't, they can't make heads or tails as to why their crops are not growing or anything. But it's due to climate change. Water quality is important, you know, uh, since I can remember, you know, water quality was a big issue for farmers around here. And it, particularly trying to put pesticides in the fields. Well, then there's runoff. So that pesticide or it is in the water and that water goes into a nearby creek and that creek goes into a river, the river goes through main waterways like the Mississippi, the Illinois, Ohio, and dumps into the Gulf of Mexico at some point. 
water quality is important. And even when we put in our water in order to feed plants and animals, it's also important. Same way with monocrops, as I talked about, um, depopulation of rural communities. And because of the depopulation of rural communities, again, a lot of people want to do agriculture anymore. They don't want to work on a farm anymore. Uh, government subsidies and big farm. Uh, these are also issues. You know, these, this is the, the, the welfare that farmers and ranchers have to deal with. They do get a percentage from the government in order to not just farm, but, you know, what they can get in order to farm. Uh, globalization is a big thing, you know, since, you know, the 90s, globalization is a one big problem. And so now we are trying to send food. We've been sending food everywhere around the world, but now doing more free trade. Then we get into issues like the North American Free Trade Act, NAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Act, CAFTA, and a few other kind of free trade agreements that we have with other countries. The European Union we have agreements with. Uh, and then again, the food access, you know, are, is there enough food that's being grown that's going to be put on the table? Or is it just enough food that's going to be for a percentage of people across the country, but then that goes into maybe livestock or seed in order to grow more crops the next year? Because that plays a role too, also, because if we don't have enough food, then, the, then again, prices go up. We may not have afford, we may not be able to afford corn any longer or soy products or anything that is put on our table when it comes from a farm. Local infrastructure, like anywhere else, infrastructure is important, but I'm, I'm talking about local transportation, uh, water supply and sanitation, soil waste management, uh, housing and urban developments, alternative energies, broadband, public broadband, that's a big issue right now. Um, th there's grants that are being divvied up right now for rural areas to have um, broadband. And, and, and as many of you in here know, um, broadband um, is something that should be more as a utility than anything else. And therefore, I'm of the opinion that should be a public utility. And I'm, and I'm willing to chip in a few dollars just to make it a public utility to make it accessible everywhere. Um, so infrastructure is important. Infrastructure is not a sexy topic, you know, when it comes to campaigning or political issues, you know, not a lot of people talk about infrastructure uh, and that's fine, but we should, we should know infrastructure because infrastructure plays a huge role. And not only creates jobs and it builds an economy, but it also addresses a lot of issues. Now, when I say a lot of issues, you know, how do we try to make more homes green? How can we turn to alternative energies, local transport? How can we make um, buses or shuttles more green? How can we turn housing into a way that we can get people into one area? Um, and then be close to the essential things they need to be at and everything. These kind of issues I'm talking about. And then there's other issues that I'm not gonna get into, um, but immigration, going back to agriculture, a lot of farmers, you know, do hire migrant workers and then people do immigrate into this country for those kind of jobs as well as one of those jobs. And so there's immigration issues when it comes to rural areas. Uh, Iowa, right next door to me, there is a meat packing plant that has a whole, a, a lot of communities that live in this one town that works in this packing plant. The Among community, uh, Tenex community, uh, there's others from, I do believe, other parts of Southeast Asia, other parts of Africa are are there just to work but they're dealing with immigration issues. And some of them have been detained by ICE because there's an ICE facility, detention center in Cedar Rapids. So a lot of them got sent there. Education is important, you know, do, 
does our communities have a sufficient amount of an education system that you can have um, pre-K through high school? And if you're fortunate enough to have a community college or, you know, be able to, well, be able to go to a public school um, in your area, but even a community college would be great if you're for, if we're fortunate enough to have those. Uh, the local ecology, that's important. We have to be mindful of our local ecology because uh, what's happening where I live does affect my neighbors to the west of me in Iowa, the north of me, Wisconsin, to the east of me, Michigan and Indiana. And so what we do here does affect these areas and abroad and human rights protection. Uh, there's not a rural area that I have not been to where um, racism has been addressed, sexism has been addressed, uh, queer and transphobia has been addressed, and the, and the question of, you know, how do we protect these communities? And so uh, this is a, another big issue that intersects with all these other topics that I just talked about. Um, so before I get on to the other stuff, is there any questions I does anyone have any questions so far about topics I just addressed? I'm trying to see what's in there. I'm just seeing some of your questions here. So there's no one, does anyone have a question? on the topic that I just referred to, or even how to address these issues. If you are on a campaign or, or think about working on a campaign. Hi, this is Jyoti. Yeah, I have a question. Who's this? Hi, this is Jyoti Chavala. Yes. Hey, thank you for your presentation. My question is regarding this COVID-19, how is this impacting poverty and homelessness and what can be done regarding ameliorating so, very good question. Um, from my observation so far, and speaking with colleagues about this, um, and then the one thing I, I didn't mention, so outside of my activism, community organizing, and political strategy work, I'm also a social service professional and nonprofit professional. Um, and in social service, um, this is a, a topic of conversation we've been talking about since COVID happened, you know, um, particularly around housing and poverty. And what some of us have been seeing, like, because there's been a lack of housing, a lot of folks had, have, have been exposed to COVID. And so they had to go to the hospital to get treated. And even there, um, some of them didn't even have insurance or didn't know they could access insurance. So th this is the other issue of a topic like this regarding a pandemic like this, because, because we have not addressed these other issues, we can't even bend the curve to have adequate um, responsibility, not responsibility, but kind of trying to get the measures in place in order to combat this. So when we have folks out there who don't have masks and there are organizations I know who put up boxes in their communities to put free masks in there. So someone who is homeless can just take one and take and have it as well as create public um, hand sanitizing dispensers, but the place takes it away because they think that's, that's, that's not sanitary that's not like they weren't permitted to do that so so people who are trying to help the homeless um are being barred from doing that so they're kind so they're letting them die i hate to be blown about it but that's what has happened so far so i haven't seen numbers on those who have been homeless and the death rate on that but if i had to venture a guess uh there's been a significant number and by significant, I would say about 10, 20% across the country. Just based on the numbers we've been seeing with COVID, I wouldn't doubt that 10, 12, 10, 20% of 
of those who are homeless have been affected, not, you know, succumb to COVID. This is, this is again, this is my observation. That's nothing um, data proven yet. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yep, thank you so much. No problem. Um, anyone else? So let's just talk about right now, like the campaign side of things. So this lovely quote, and if sure Hillary uh, will somewhat appreciate this quote that came from James Carville when he worked on Bill Clinton's 92 campaign, where he, he said, you know, Philadelphia is, Pennsylvania is Philadelphia on one end, Pittsburgh's on the other, and Alabama in the middle. Um, this is James Carville's perspective of Pennsylvania. And um, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's these kind of things that, you know, some of us can probably laugh at because we, we live in our states and like, that's true to a degree. But, and, and this is something that, that politics, when we talk about campaigning and doing electoral action, as I said earlier, we tend to gravitate to our metro areas when it comes to the electoral action and everything. We try to recruit candidates to um, run for office in our chapters and what have you, and albeit they are rural, we, we, we do do that. We do our best efforts to do that. But for the most part, um, they've been a little bit more metro centric to one degree or another. Some of you have probably have a copy of this book, um, What's the Matter with Kansas? Uh, it came out in, I believe in 04. Um, this was uh, a very, very class, I consider it like a classic text when it comes to understanding where we're at today. Um, when we think about how we got here, when I say when we got here, how conservatives took over this place, we can go back to Goldwater when um, when he lost, and then from there conservatives got together. William Buckley was one of the architects of this, and for those of you who don't know William Buckley, just YouTube him sometime. William Buckley, uh, he did Crossfire. Um, you may not appreciate his politics, but I kind of enjoyed his debate and understanding the mind of what William Buckley was trying to convey at the time. So Buckley and others got every single conservative together, the fiscal conservatives, the evangelicals, the social, the moderates, libertarians together at the same table and saying, we have to, we have to win shit. That's what he was saying. So they got Nixon in office. They got a whole bunch of people elected from the local level to the national level. <clears throat> they get Reagan in office. Um, and then you got George Bush senior in office. Then they had a little bump because Clinton won, but they still won because he was a conservative. Then they got George junior in there. And now we have Trump. So from this text, what Thomas Frank is saying that there was an ideological shift in, in, in the conservative mindset that there used to be the social and economic issues and they want equality. Again, from Frank's perspective that conservatives wanted social and economic equality, but they shifted that to cultural issues. They made issues like abortion, LGBT rights, women's rights, all these other cultural issues, a hot topic issue. And because of that, they shifted their base to more of a populist movement. And we kind of see that with Trump when, when he ran the first time and his only time. Um, so we, we see that on what Trump did in the campaign that what he what he did is what Thomas Frank was saying back then is that this populist movement and made things a hot issue and that shifted the base. 
Frank also points out that Democrats also had to shift their base. They shifted more to a conservative perspective. They're still a center-right party, but they even went more right ideologically. Uh, and we can see that with Clinton and the new Democrats. Um, they focus more on conservative perspective. And we can see that through like globalization efforts, NAFTA, CAFTA, as I mentioned before. And as I said, this is a starting point. 2020, 2010 election. Excuse me. I had the good fortune at the time. I, I moved to Milwaukee at this point. I moved there in 09 from Illinois. And I got to see the whole Scott Walker fiasco getting elected and everything. And then the 2010 election happens. What you see here is the results of that election. So I bring this up because this ties into the what's matter with Kansas. Frank was talking about stuff during early 2000s. Now we get to 2010. Scott Walker gets elected. Um, I think um, Snyder in Michigan got elected around that time, and not just before. Um, a few other like-minded conservatives like Walker got elected into governorships and state assemblies at the time. And what, what we see here is uh, if you see a map before Scott Walker, there was a little bit more blue. And also there have been a lot of Greens elected in the state of Wisconsin. A lot of them got elected around the Oshkosh area, Milwaukee area, um, Dane County, where Madison's at. Um, so we had Greens elected even up to this point and, and still right now. And this here, I did an article at the Independent Voter Network where I, I witnessed this. And if you notice this in Walker's recall in 2012, um, we started seeing conservatives pick, picketing off these rural areas. And I said, rural communities make big impacts. So if you go to these, one of these rural counties in Wisconsin, particularly the Northwoods, and Northwoods would be where it says Eau Claire up, you start picking off all these smaller rural communities, you're gonna, win, you're gonna win races. And if you win races there, then you're gonna win races in the governor's mansion, in the state house, in Senate. So this is what Republicans have been doing. They went around and started building their base in 2010. If we look at the numbers from here to the recall election, which was 2012, what is these light blue counties are now red. So Wisconsin was a whole red state. And some would argue it's still a red state to this day, um, even with the current governor that's in office. Um, so it's now making it a swing state this year. So this is a very important thing when we look at these rural areas and how they make big impacts like what's happened, what happened in Wisconsin. Uh, another book, another text that I recommend you getting at some point is this one, uh, Red State, Blue State, Rich State, Poor State. And um, Andrew Gilman is a statistician at Columbia University. He's in the political science department. And he uses a lot of statistics analysis when it comes to voting behavior. And the, the main takeaway from this text is that context matters. Context really does matter. And, and it matters about like how religion plays a role in voting how income plays a role in voting when it comes to cable news is how you vote. And, um, no, come on. So, oh, I thought I took that slide out. Yeah, sorry. So in, 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 this, in this book, uh, so like we can look at a, an area like uh, Mississippi. Mississippi has always voted um, Republican and everything. But if you look, if you look, if you had to dissect Mississippi a little bit, we can see areas 
where they do vote differently. Places like in Jackson, for example, they vote differently than they do, say that like in, in, in Biloxi, you know, two different areas. Um, same, same as said for like Maryland, how Baltimore votes is different than Chevy Chase, Maryland, you know? Um, so we have to look within our states on how voting works because we tend to see more suburban areas, those with more higher income, the more affluent, or as Gilman says, rich people. The more money you make, the tend you vote a little bit more for um, your interests in certain things like social issues is just a luxury that you can just vote on as well. But if you do make less money or what he deems as poor working class folk, as I call them, uh, they're going to be voting a whole different other interests. And a lot of us in here know, know this and everything. But again, I bring this up because this is, these are numbers that we have to be mindful of because the stuff, the tea leaves are right there for us. All we have to do is kind of interpret these tea leaves to our best interests. Um, so how do we Tai Chi this stuff saying, okay, we have this information. How do we get a green elected? How can we talk about this issue? So that's the important things that we need to be able to become analytical to this kind of information. Another thing in this text that Gilman talks about is this I, um, idea of um, availability bias. And so this little image here is essentially what availability bias is. You know, we rely on information that's available than what's relevant. So things like, you know, I know someone who's, who's lived 100 years old, smoked three packs a day. So smoking can't be that bad, right? Even though it's, you know, 450,000 deaths a year because of smoking. Or as some of us know, a relative or more. I saw it on Fox News, so it has to be true. A lot of people who are political hobbyists, again, people who are political hobbyists tend to look at information that's really available than looking at the grand scheme of things. And it's because of this availability bias. And I gotta say, some of us in our own party tend to do this as well. I gotta say this. Because again, when we look at something like Fox News, and I talk about context is important. Retirees tend to vote Republican. And the median age for Fox viewers, as well as for MSNBC viewers, is 65 years in age, that demographic will vote Republican. So I say this because if this is the information they're only seeing, and if you live in a rural area in like my town, I have a news, uh, excuse me, a radio station that only does Fox News. That's the only information they get. Our local newspaper is ran by a libertarian. So they're only getting the information right there. So if their only window of information is this availability of, oh, this is the narrative that is being provided for you, that's the worldview. So we have to go outside that and go, okay, this is what you're saying, but what is this newspaper saying? Oh, what is that person saying? This is the important about networking with one another. This is important to network within our state. I'm like, hey, I heard about this. Is this true? Is this what's going on and everything? So how's this related to COVID when it comes to this kind of bias? So this is Iowa's. So what Iowa did for COVID, their, de their Department of Public Health created six regions, okay? <coughs> Iowa to this day has not shut down as a state and they should have. This is not my opinion. They just should have. Because they have a, a, they have a, a lot of rising numbers in that state. 
Um, so the only way the governor would declare to shut the state down is that each of these six regions regions have a scorecard. And if they score a threshold number, if, if all six of them score this high number, then the entire state will shut down. Now, if you can see on your screen, if you look at region nine, and there's a little nook there. So that little nook, well, yeah, so this bottom region, there's gonna be two of them that says region nine, excuse me. Region one, region six. So if you look at region one, which is the bottom part of the state in red, that little nook there, there are two cities there. One's Iowa City, one Cedar Rapids. And I hope someone on here is from Iowa to help me correct this also. But Iowa City and Cedar Rapids are very close to each other. Rapids has had higher cases than Iowa City. And Iowa City has University of Iowa Hospital, which a lot of people go to. But because Iowa City has, has shown lower numbers than Cedar Rapids, even though they're like very close to each other, they've kind of been showing similar things when it comes to data, um, they just couldn't do it. They just couldn't shut the state down. So I can't help to ask, I'm like, was this created, was this gerrymandered in order to provide this kind of data, you know? And again, hear me what I'm saying here. I'm not saying this is a hoax. We can manipulate our own information in order to shut a state down or not. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. So this kind of availability bias, which I consider this availability bias, that we can work numbers in our favor and say, oh, our state's fine. Go outside, have a drink, don't wear a mask because we have the numbers to prove it. Well, again, no shit, because you kind of manufacture these things. This, this is important that we have to know this is why recently I've been kind of more an advocate of Greens doing, uh, looking at more public health issues like this, because we can gerrymander our own information. And this is just Iowa. Illinois is different. New York's different. I don't know what other states are like, but just between Illinois and Iowa, it's a shit show when it comes to all this. So again, Metro rural divide. I'm sure all of us in our states have this kind of division in Illinois. Depending where you live in Illinois, you either are from Chicago, from the suburbs, or downstate. And in Illinois, downstate means the entire state of Illinois is considered downstate for people from Chicago. But if you're from downstate, just like, no, there's northern Illinois, central Illinois, southern Illinois. But there's this divide um, in Illinois, you know, because all of us outside of the suburbs in Chicago see that area differently and vice versa. And I've been um, privileged enough to have lived in Chicago as well as most of downstate Illinois to understand this, to see what's going on. And while there are issues that all of us are universally agreed on, there is still this divide because of how these areas are divided for a lot of reasons, political reasons, mostly. Um, and we probably have these kind of issues like within our own chapters. I mean, there's, there's times, so we have to meet here instead of here because various reasons, accessibility, it's, it's hard to drive out there. There's no transportation, all valid things, but these are the kind of conversations we need to talking about when it comes to understanding political landscape and so i bring up wisconsin again because a lot of us on here have li are living in states that has like more than one major town wisconsin has three madison milwaukee and home of the green bay packers green bay <clears throat> and so we have like this kind of divide and you, if you live in wisconsin i'm like oh it's it's madison milwaukee and everyone else because Mass and Milwaukee and Wisconsin um, bring in 45% of the state's income, economically speaking. And so those two towns and Green Bay doesn't shy away from that either, but between Mass and Milwaukee areas, um, 
there's that divide. If you're living in, as I said, in Wisconsin, it's those two versus all of us. And it may be, may have that same thing. If you live in like Pennsylvania, if you live in New York, if you live in Maryland, live in Texas, California, um, you probably have those same feelings in your own respect family. It's us versus them. So there's also even regional division. Um, so in Colorado, the one thing I love about Cal, I've always loved Colorado politics because it's this interesting thing where you have these kind of regional things. <clears throat> so you have like the high plains, the front range, which is like right in front of the rain, mountain ranges and everything. Then you have the Western slope. Then like we have the mountains and everything. And the, the, the times I have spent in Colorado, um, I, always, I was always intrigued of learning this kind of regional division when you're listening to like issues in their um, state house and hearing things like well the representative from the Washington Slope doesn't understand those of us on the what on the front reins you know um, and it's probably the same if you live in Minnesota it's like well those of, those of you who live in the Iron Range don't understand for those of us who live down here in the valley you know um, we, we, and we all have this to some degree and there are, and because of this division, we have to understand issues that we may not recognize. And that's important to know. So when we do for run, one for races, um, and especially in rural areas, they tend to be more bigger areas. There's not a lot of um, state rep races. And I don't know all the state house races in the United States, but the ones I know of don't really overlap with a metro area or a suburban area so a lot of them tend like this this is the iowa senate district 49 and um well, as you can see here there's a lot of rural areas in here and the way they cut it out um if you kind of see it like right here it says scott county scott county is a more affluent in a more populated area and that kind of got kicked out a little bit this is a congressional district in my con my congressional district here in illinois again this is kind of gerrymandered um and as you can see it goes all the way up here to like rockford illinois which is the third largest fourth largest city in illinois all the way down to peoria to the Quad City, so you have like three populated areas, and then in between here is rural areas. Um, so a lot of the votes in a congressional district that may have rural areas really come out of areas like towns, in this case, Rockford, um, East Moline, Moline, Rock Island, and the Quad Cities in Peoria. We, we cannot negate um, tribal land when we talk about campaign rural areas because they're, they're, they get shoved into rural areas. And so this is a map of the current um, lands reservations here in the United States. Um, and, and, I, and I gotta be honest, I, I am not up to speed as how does one campaign <clears throat> um, that has a reservation in their district. Um, though colleagues of mine who I've talked to about this, you know, you know, one of the big things that a person can do is just introduce yourself in a, in a reservation um, and trying to build bridges that way on how to work with indigenous communities that that district represents. And, you know, if you are, are of rad politics, um, how, how can we start decolonizing land? And if you haven't heard today, um, I believe it was uh, one of the Supreme Courts. I think the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court in Oklahoma, um, recognized tribal land as being a, a, a recognized land. So it sounds like Oklahoma might strive towards decolonization at this point. So what do Republicans and Democrats lose? Well, they don't listen to working class folk at all. Democrats and Republicans do lean, favor lean into big business. Global, they're always global 
globalization centered. Their whole focus are in metro areas. So drive through, fly over, around rural areas a lot. Um, and of course, in rural areas, you know, they'll vote Republican Democrats to support their agenda because they don't know don't know about us or they try not to know about us. So like so this is like some areas that Republicans and Democrats lose. Um, I see two hands raised. Who are those? Like Molly and then Joshua. Molly, go ahead. I see you, Joshua. Hi, everyone. Thanks for letting me speak. Uh, so, something just quick on what um, what AJ was speaking about before, and plus, a lot of the rural communities, these endorsements that you can get to help you with your campaign. They're either controlled by um, a Democrat that's in charge. Like I live in, in, in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, but I worked on campaigns in Southern Minnesota. And the only union that is down there that would endorse is headed by the head of the local CD's Democratic Party. So they will automatically always give it. So you can't get any really fundraising and really kind of build the momentum and build support. So it is very frustrating. So it thank is. Thank you, Molly. Joshua. Joshua, you're there. I sound like, I'm sound like I'm back in my old radio talk show. Joshua, are you over there? Yeah, I'm still here. I think hey, you Josh. just heard from Joshua and it was Molly that wasn't ready after the hand raising. Oh, so it's and Molly's turn. Someone's asking how to raise your hand. And as host, I don't see the same things you do. I think that if you click on participants and then hover near your name, there's a more you know, you can get more options and raise hand is in there, or it's actually at the bottom, sorry, of the participant box. Is that Brendan has raised? Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I just had a couple comments I wanted to make. So my name is Brendan Phillips. I ran for Tooele County Commissioner in 2018, which is um, it's a rural part of Utah. It's like 70% Republican district. So I have some experience running in these sort of areas. A couple of things I wanted to add was um, one big thing in rural areas is those who live in unincorporated areas. Um, I know I live in an unincorporated area. And what that means is that we're not like a recognized municipality. You know, our city doesn't have its own government. We fall under the jurisdiction of the county government. So a lot of times what happens is our unincorporated area gets neglected by county leaders um, who have more stake in their locales, right? Like our county commission is, in the past, it's been generally led by people who were elected from the most populous city in the county, which is Tooele. And so those folks naturally have Tooele's interests in mind versus unincorporated parts of the county. So a lot of times these unincorporated areas um, get neglected by their county governments and they, they, they don't get listened to at all. Um, what's funny about that is that also in these rural areas, you have a lot of folks who don't believe in government, right? They want as minimal government as possible. So when the concept of incorporation came up for a vote where I live in 2018, it was voted down because these people saw it as another layer of government that they would have to work with. And, um, you know, I think in retrospect, a lot of people wish that they had voted to incorporate because you know, we get neglected by our county commissioners we have for years, and we finally had the opportunity to kind of take matters into our own hands and our rural area voted it down because they didn't want an additional layer of government. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of times in rural areas, these seats go uncontested. Um, you know, there's so many races that get run where there's no competitor. It's just one candidate. So, you know, if you're considering a run for office in a rural area, 
I suggest waiting before you decide what you want to run for. Like, don't get any in your head, right? I'm going to run for this and like do it no matter what. I would wait. I would see who decides to run in your area, what seats are uncontested, where people haven't filed, and I would make your decision closer to the deadline. I hate to say put things off and wait until the last minute, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in waiting and seeing, you know, this district, nobody filed, and um, I have an opportunity to run there versus a district where five people filed, right? So that's all I wanted to add. I hope it's helpful. Okay. No, thank you, Brendan. Um, Molly, I see you. I just want to make this one point because it's something that Brendan just even mentioned. Um, so when we, we're running for office, we have to look at areas we want to run in, as Brendan said, you know, so we have to research these areas and look, are they being uncontested? If so, what's those percentages and all that great stuff? Hello, this is Hillary Kane. Hey, Hillary. Sorry. Hold on a second. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, let's also look for these unique opportunities in local races. So in Illinois, we have a, well, we have, we, we have county coroners. If you don't know what coroner is, essentially the job is, is to pronounce someone dead. Essentially that's what the job is. The county coroner in Illinois is the only person that can arrest the sheriff. So think about this for a second. <clears throat> someone pronounced someone dead and they do the autopsy and do the report and everything, right? So in, in Illinois' great mind, who can arrest a sheriff? Well, we need some accountability. So let's get the county coroner to do it. So if you want to run on a Black Lives Matter campaign, what do you do? You run for county coroner. Sure, you got to deal with dead people, but... You get to arrest a sheriff. You can you put a sheriff's accountability there. Now, I, I know I'm somewhat making light of it, but these are the kind of unique opportunities we have to be mindful of. Community college board. School board's great, but if you have if you have a community college and you run that, most community colleges districts are about the same size as a Senate state Senate district. So if you're on a community college board and it's between four or six years, that's a Senate district, and you want to advance your political career if you want to, then you can probably run for something like state Senate or state representative. Because community colleges run a whole slew of issues besides education, um, trade, trade classes, a whole slew of things. Um, just want to get through these and answer any quick questions. Um, so we have to understand the lay of the land politically that way. We have to understand the issues in our area. So by doing that from an organizing standpoint, attend community events, organizations, coalitions, and partnerships. Um, I can speak to some of those experiences I've done too also, but we're almost running out of time. Some of your rural organizations are gonna be mostly nonprofits, um, faith-based organizations. You may have a business that's involved somehow an active political organization these days, um, Indivisible, the Democratic Party front group um, are in uh, rural areas and work in rural areas a lot. So campaign team, whether it's a political issue or uh, electoral action or organizing, it's probably be the same staff. You're gonna have a very small staff hopefully have weekly meetings with key campaign members and everything by a small staff, campaign manager, treasurer, um, fundraiser, uh, communications director, those five I would have at least. Um, so those are the suggested lists that they have on the slide. Um, same thing for the issues, there's a lot of common ground. The only difference is for organizing, you know, trying to find a, a um, lead organizers and field director when it comes to an issue and activities, house parties, or, you know, these, in these days, you know, house parties via Zoom, um, speaking events, um, endorsements, um, building a database through the campaign, um, uh, trying to build a local movement. 
somehow through electoral action or whatever the issue that you want to do with. One-on-one -on -one organizing is a big thing in community organizing. Um, and one-on-one, -on -one, if you don't know, is simply like uh, I go to Brendan's house and know Brendan more and see how he's doing. Oh, I heard he's a DJ. Tell me more about that. Oh, you have family. That's great. You know, and then we keep having these meetings to get to know each other and keep doing it with other people. That's how we build relationships. And that's how we get to know people and figure out the resources that they have in order to move, make our movements. So AJ, the, I hate to yeah. bust in here and sorry for that phone call earlier, but we are at time. Um, so can you wrap up in like the next one or two minutes? That's, I'm done. I, I, Wait, <laughs> that was it. This was fabulous and clearly there was a lot to chew on. Um, it has been recorded. It will go up on a Green Party website in the next week or so. Um, so please, I'm sure we'll be sending out emails later with the, all of the videos that we have taken. Um, so I just, I want to thank AJ for their time and participation as a workshop presenter and all of you for yeah, um, showing up today. The, the slides would be appreciated. Yes. And we will make sure slides get out. So AJ, if you can email me your slide deck later, that would be great. Um, Thank you. And yeah, so I'm gonna stop the recording.